it is Both Sides Book Club. We are on our first episode of season two. Year two. I cannot believe we have made it whole year and one. And we're still going. <laughs> and we're still talking. And we still have lots of things to talk about, which is amazing. That's because we are so great. Just kidding. <laughs> so everybody, welcome back and welcome to season two. We're so excited to bring you yet another year of awesome, awesome books and hopefully some awesome, awesome conversations. <laughs> Amazing. So if not, turn off now. Yes, uh, but then turn back on because it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Mum, what, what was your highlight of the week this week? My highlight really was actually spending heaps of time with you. Um, Katie, as you all know, is is having a baby really soon. Or if you and don't know, then you should you know. You should know. <laughs> and... Um, you stopped work last week, yep. so we've been having a lovely time having walks and coffee and, and more chats. Yes, yep. yeah. So that's been, yeah, I've had a lovely week. And what are you looking forward to most next week? I'm going to Tassie. Oh, my God, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot wait. I'm sorry, so sorry. Although, although I've totally forgotten how to travel. Oh, yeah. Just actually the thought of having to pack a suitcase has been totally doing my head in. <laughs> like, I like... It used to be slick, but now it's just like, oh, what do I need? What have I got to take? Oh, dear. I, oh, oh, so cry I, me I'm a still, river. So I'm still not packed. So while I'm sitting at home waddling, you're complaining to me about packing. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> just kidding. Suck it up, princess. <laughs> just kidding. What about you? Um, highlight of this week, I would also say, is the same as you. It was... Um, That's know, just as well. It's so sickly, isn't it, that both of our highlights are that we can... <laughs> um, no, but that, that was a highlight. And also, we got a sneaky ultrasound this week, so that was really great. Um, mm. Just to be able to see the baby moving and see it so big. So that's made me definitely really excited that yes. things are starting to progress and happen and we can have a little little tiny little book reader on our episode very soon um and the thing i'm looking forward to most next week is um just having my partner home for for yeah. a, a while he's been um away working and um yeah just excited to spend some so you actually time. don't have to get out of bed and make your own coffee in the morning well yes because you see this is difficult <laughs> these days <laughs> I have to get out of bed so many times in the middle of the night to pee. So, you know, it's, it's nice to have a coffee in the morning. It so, is. yeah, I'm really excited to spend some time with him. Um, so, to jump on in, so the first book that we have got for May is Ta da! The Funny Thing About Norman Foreman by Julietta Henderson. And oh, we love this book yeah, so much. Yeah, we did. It, you know what? Such a such a great book to start off with season two, and also with Mother's Day coming around the corner. It's a beautiful book about a mother and a son and their relationship. I defy you not to like it. Yes, I, <laughs> exactly. We dare you not to. Um, so, for really quickly, what the book's about. If you haven't read it, or if you would like a recap because you read it so quickly because it's so great, um, it is a story about a mother and son. And um, unfortunately, the son, without this being a spoiler, as it happens very early on in the in the book, um, the son loses his best friend, and um, it's basically the he him Norman, the son, and his best friend Jax had written a sort of a five year plan of something that they would really really like to achieve, which is to perform at this comedy festival in Edinburgh, and so the story just basically follows. Um, the mum doing the best job that she can to get her son to perform at this comedy festival without his best friend. And it's just, it's sweet, it's endearing, yeah. it's lovely, um, it's a beautiful relationship. It's funny. It's funny, it's a beautiful relationship between mother and son and just one of those really feel-good, feel-good books. An uplit book. Yes, exactly. And because we're awesome, we are so excited that we have got a brilliant author who will be joining us very shortly. We are super excited to speak to Julieta herself and to unravel some of the things in the book. Hi. Julieta, hi. Oh my gosh, I've got you up so loud, I'm going to deafen myself. <laughs> <laughs> how are you? I hope that doesn't. I'm good, how are you? Good, thank We're you. Very well, thank Welcome you. Welcome to Both Sides Book Club. 
Thank you. Lovely to meet you, ladies. Absolutely. I feel like I, I, feel like I know you because I've seen you on, on Instagram and everything. So I feel like I know your faces. I know That's who good. you are. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, first off, I absolutely adore your cover on your book. I have to say it's really beautiful. Thank you. It's really like oh, that's, simple and eloquent. I, it's really lovely. Mm. You know, I love it now, but I tell you, I had such mixed feelings when they first sent it through to me. It was so different to what I had expected yeah. and what I thought yeah. I liked. And I was, oh, like for about 24 hours, I lay in my bed and I was like, oh, I don't oh, know really? if I like this. No, I Honestly, but and now I I actually can't imagine it being anything else. I love well, I can well because you're the US, US because oh, the US, US cover and have to okay. Which do you prefer? Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that too has grown on me. Yeah, but, and, and and yeah, look, it's grown on me. And people say they love it, but they might be saying that anyway. I don't know, but I love this one so much more. Yes. and that's why I get really. It's really funny because I can't, I don't know how Goodreads works, but that always shows up on Goodreads now instead right. of that, so I don't know. Well, I think, I because, know I think because a lot of, of Goodreads is um, is generated from the US, so yeah. so often you tend to find that it's actually the American covers and things mm, that, right. that, that come up oh, rather okay. than the UK or Australian um, covers. Yeah. So the yeah, so the book's anyway. just is actually just now being published in the UK, isn't it? In in um, the end of April. Oh, yeah. At the end of April, and that's actually where it was supposed to be. For, that's where yeah. I got, that's where my publisher is. That's where yeah. my agent is. That's yeah. where that was supposed to be the first, and it's almost the last now. Even the Dutch are going before the Dutch are going on the twenty eighth. <laughs> <so, yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so so but Sorry. the but they but the UK have got the same cover as us because normally they're the same. Yeah, it, it is the UK cover and yeah. the Aussies bought the UK cover. So, yeah, so it's all the same. So it is, um, yeah, it's a, it's a trans world cover. The girl from trans world designed that. So, yeah, so it's, <laughs> and anyway. And, oh, oh, it's, it's, oh, that's oh, great. Oh, oh, so it's like, anyway, yes, but, it's more embossed. It's, oh, my gosh, it's so shiny. That's fantastic. It's so shiny. Yay. And actually what they did, I got a new editor before it, but my beautiful first editor in the UK, she ended up moving to Simon & Schuster and I got a new editor and they changed the tagline on the front, which actually I prefer because it was how can he make them laugh if he's forgotten how to smile. Yeah. And there was always part of me that was like, oh, yeah, I like it, but it was really focusing on Norman and for me this is it's just as much Sadie's story. Yeah. So now it says it was a journey they would always remember for a friend they'd never forget and I love that. Oh, yeah, that's so, great. Oh, that's so mm, sweet. Yeah. Mm. That's so sweet. Yeah. So anyway, well, just good. in case Very you were I love it. Looks the same, it just sounds different. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for writing such a fabulous book. We um as we like to try and chop and change our themes in our book club so we kind of keep things um fresh and different um, different types of genres of books. But yeah, we don't yeah. want to be pigeonholed as, no. as, as reading any, any you know, particular um, type of, of, uh, of yeah. novel. Readers. And yeah. I just. Yeah, I think yeah. I've definitely noticed that with the, go with, the, with the guests that you have. I have definitely noticed that. I have to say oh, that's one of the you. things I'm just like, oh, right, they, they've got a really diverse, I like that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think as well in our book club, we, we like picking books that have a bit more depth to it as well. Um, yeah. And oh, good. I, have, I absolutely love. I absolutely loved reading. That was a, that was a, that was a backhand compliment. No, no, right? well, no. It just. It, oh, shut up! I, you know what I both. You both know what I mean. I'm not going to try and hide reading. what I mean. I, I took it as a. I took it as a total compliment. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's there's stuff that's going on, and um, and I I per, I personally absolutely loved 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 reading this. I just loved um, oh. I, I loved the the tone. I, I was trying to. I, I was asking my mum this the other day on a walk. Is there a literary? Is there a correct um, terminology for saying that the character's voice or the character's tone, the the way that they? I don't know. Is there a correct? Remember, we were saying, is there a, is is there a way Isn't to put it, that? Is it the voice. Um... Well, well, that's yeah. what I said. I mean, that yeah, the, vo the voice of the characters versus the voice of the narrator. But yeah. I don't actually think there is. Uh, not that I could think of anyway. Yeah, I, I, yeah, not that I can think of, but I'm, I'm not great on literary terms. Some, mm. I, look, I'd never heard the term uplit until no. I got told I'd written, I'd written uplit. <laughs> <laughs> but but so, it's, you know, it's funny you should say that and we probably will wait till we're recording to say this, but it, but it is funny you should say that because I've had my friends that have read it um, have said, 
all like they're reading it in bed or reading it on the train or whatever and all they can hear is me speaking and I said oh is that good or is that bad and they're like oh no 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 it's good and it's Uh. really funny but 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 that's only people that know me, so that's no, yeah. so interesting. I'm, well, I'm trying know. to work out whether I'm taking that as a compliment or well, not. Well, basically, what I'm trying to say is that we're going to be best friends because if that's what your voice <laughs> is, and I really <laughs> liked reading it, then you know. <laughs> excellent, excellent. You're on the list. You're top of the list already. <laughs> Amazing. So, Julieta, um, this is your first novel. Um, but you've been a professional writer for many, many years, doing lots of diverse things. Had you, have you always wanted to be a novelist? And, and you know, if so, well, then what was the catalyst for you to write a novel? I'll, I'll go backwards. I'll mm. start from the last question. But definitely, I have, or I've been banging on about writing a book for a very long time, probably since, I don't know, probably since I was a child, I've always wanted to write a book. And I've written many books, and I'll put that in inverted commas right. because they don't exist. They certainly haven't been published. But I think it's really interesting that, yes, I have been writing professionally for a long, long time, but I, not even possibly, I definitely got into writing professionally because I already wrote creatively and that's what I wanted to do. And so when I got, I mean, I did a lot of jobs before I started writing mm-hmm. professionally, you know, as a as a a very young lady <laughs> you know I did all the I did everything I can't even think of one thing that I haven't done no that's that's a whole other conversation <laughs> that's a new book <laughs> um, no it's not even true it's just that I did so I remember I think of when I was 30 I'd counted up my jobs and I'd done 30 jobs and I said right I'm, that's where I'm going to go for the rest of my life I'm going to do a job a year anyway um but when I got, the first time I got a job writing was actually by mistake because I worked, um, I was working in a gallery, um, I was working for a photographer and the only reason I went and worked in that photography gallery is because I harboured ambition to be a photographer and I was very keen as a photographer and I started hmm. working for him and he became very rich and famous and has galleries all over the world now and he, it just, I did something, I, I i don't know, maybe I wrote something for him, wrote a newsletter or something like that. And he was like, oh my God, you can write. So I very quickly moved from working in the gallery to working in the creative department, which was just okay. me, him mm. and a graphic designer. Mm. Mm. Um, and so I became the writer for that. It was a small book of publishing. So I've done a lot of writing, did a lot of writing that way. And that was so much fun because it was really super creative because yeah. I was more or less ghost writing for him. And That's he was amazing. A bit of a, character and I had to pretend to be him and so it was like the most fun I had in my ever you know in my life and I did that for a long time and oh, probably for 10 years and then when I moved to one of the times I moved to London I finally just thought oh why am I doing these jobs that I don't really want to do you know just and I just writing is one of the things that you sort of speak for yourself and if you don't you don't have to have a massive portfolio of or not you do have to have a portfolio but you don't have a massive resume of jobs because you can just send in and go well this is my writing yeah and so I did yeah. get in with a um I started writing for a marketing company and uh, an online marketing company and in fact scarily amount of years later I actually still work for that guy on a contract basis okay that's amazing yeah. that's amazing, mm-hmm. that's After, amazing. Yeah, so I say yeah amongst various other writing things but but yeah so that's a roundabout way of saying that I I always wanted to write creatively and I think I got my I got the satisfaction out of my paid work, which was very lucky um, for me. But then I, and I've always done things like gone off for a few months and, you know, um, lived in Paris and gone to Italy for months on time, just, you know, rent a room and, and sit there and type and away and pretend type to be away. a star. How romantic. <laughs> <laughs> but really spending a lot, a lot more time walking the streets and doing things like that than actually writing. But um, yes. And then I, I, you know, so I have several semi-finished novels but this one was the one that sort of kept me going to the end mm. and and yeah so it, it is something it is like a dream come true and I should have done it a long time ago but I try and not um think that way because I don't think if, I, if I'd done this or if I'd gone to the path we're trying to get pub- yeah. I mean I've never tried to get published before it's not like I've been mm. banging my yeah. head against a brick wall I was yeah. very lucky I wanted to get published and, and here I am but um, I, I think maybe if I'd written it um, earlier, 
it wouldn't be the book it was or it wouldn't be a book it wouldn't be this book at all or you know I so th- I, tr- I try and think I think I, I, th- I think that's true for for a lot of authors I mean we've um certainly in the in the last year we've um we've um, tried to include you know quite a few debut authors um oh. who you know just written the most amazing books I know I know that you um that you particularly also particularly like The Last Migration by um Charlotte McConaughey which you know which we did <laughs> People we did last me year saying I like it so much <laughs> I know um so um it, it, it does seem to be that you know that people have been writing in one form or another for for however however long, mm. um, but there is one novel, and it's that novel that has to get written um, at a certain time that that really okay. launches um, authors' careers. Mm. Mm. And probably too, not yeah. having the pressure as well to to perform under a certain, you know, like to be able to write in that free flowing natural state, I can imagine would probably be a lot more Absolutely. fruitful. Absolutely. It's, it's, and I'm finding that now, although I'm not, I'm not having that, you know, dreadful second novel syndrome. I'm not, you know, touch wood, mm. whatever I want to touch. I'm not having that, but it's such a different process to be yes. writing a book, you know, oh yes, I'm writing a book and yes, it's taken me, you know, a million years mm. and it's very different because yeah, exactly what you just said there, Kate, there's, there's no pressure on you. Yes. Only, only the pressure you only, only yourself. Only yourself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, which yeah. is quite a lot. That's that's just all inner turmoil going, oh, I should have done this or I should be doing this and, and which no one ever sees except Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So where did the inspiration for Norman Foreman come from? Well, the, the Norman and Sadie came to me a long time before the story came. They just, and it's one of those things that, you know, authors are very fond of saying, oh, you know, they I came to me fully for. Yeah, their voices <laughs> came to me. Yes, yes, yes. And We've I, heard it before. I, 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 Give me some new material. Yeah, yeah, Come yeah. on. <laughs> you have been doing a bit of the Lord, the Lord Byron, you know, having a little bit too much Lord and and hallucinations. It's so funny because I've heard for years that phrase, oh, they came to me fully formed. In and dream. I've never gone. <laughs> I've never done it. Done any? I've never rolled my eyes or anything. But I roll my eyes when I hear myself saying it now because it is, it is, it is the absolute truth. And I try not to say it now, so I'll think of they arrived to no, me. No, and no, they no, were, no, 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 no! Don't be insecure about it. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I look, look. It's almost like. I woke up one morning and they were in my head. I think that's, I don't remember the exact time. But so I had this kid in my head and I, and and he was always with a mother. I don't know why. Sadie was not so fully formed as Norman. I just wanted this, this kid that was a quirky little kid and all the rest of it. But I think the, the real thing that got me started on the plot line was um, I started to think, what if, what if, the, you know how everything happens for a reason and you've got to, you can kind of justify lots of sort of thing. I started thinking about like what would be, what if the worst thing that ever happened in your life actually led you to the best thing and that yeah. if that worst thing hadn't happened, imagine if, it, you know, like if yeah, you didn't yeah, meet absolutely. someone because yeah. some a friend absolutely, hadn't passed yeah. away or something like that. And um, so that was the real kernel of the start. And then I started to think about comedy and I'm a big comedy fan and I, I wanted Norman to be, a comedian and I just look I, I I can't remember again where it first came to but I, I started thinking I think I was watching I think I was actually at a stand-up comedy and this is what I've told myself now I'm <laughs> well, trying to true, think, but, yes. and I think it might be of mm. someone who wasn't that great and I thought imagine how awful that would be if comedy was the only thing you ever wanted to do in your life but imagine if you were really really bad, bad at it. it like where would that lead you and sort of so that's how I got to got to you know start the, the plot started sort of ticking on in yes. my head and in fact the book wasn't I, I actually wasn't um writing this I was I was writing a very different book which is still there inside the computer somewhere, somewhere. I was writing a really different book for a long time I was working on that for a long time and I was going I was back here, but then I was going back to London because I did a lot of back and back and forth. And I was going back to London to do, um, I call it a summer school with Curtis Brown Creative, which is a literary agency creative yeah, yeah. school. Mm-hmm. And they, because I'd done a course through them before, they invited you back for a, um, a, a 
yeah, summer school they called it. So it was just a week's intensive in the office. And to be perfectly honest with you, because I'd done their course online and, and they're so they're they're sort of legendary like Curtis Brown. And I really, really wanted to be inside the offices. I really wanted to be inside the offices of this literary it is and great. See what they were like. So I signed up for this one week. I mean, I was going to London anyway, or I tell myself that. But I was going to London and so I signed up for this course and, of course, it was everything I wanted it to be. Like you walk, these offices are, they're not amazing to look at, but they're just, you just feel, you oh, feel you're hundreds yeah. of years oh, I, I, yes. sort of oozing out of the. And, in fact, while I was there, we were in sort of a, um, it was like a fishbowl conference room and there was, we were around a round table. There was about, I think it was about 12 of us that were doing this week-long thing. And the guy next to me was an Australian. I've always wondered what happened to him. So if he's listening, um <laughs> Whatever happened to you and your story? Because he had the best book best idea. Best story ever. of the lot. Anyway, it was amazing, <laughs> but I've never seen it. I've never seen it published, so I don't think he's been published yet. Um, anyway, he nudged me and he goes, look, look, look. And it was um, Barry Humphreys was at the reception desk. Yeah. Because you know, he's, he's one of it. So it was really funny. Anyway, oh. but anyway, so for that, sorry. Uh, so for that week long, we had to have something that we were working on. And, of course, you know, the logical thing was to was to be the novel that I'd practically finished was to be working on that. And on the plane over, I just got oh, I'd really lost. I'd just lost my mojo with it. Yeah. And I don't think I I don't think I'd done anything on it for a couple of months even. So and you know, in writing terms, that's a million years. If you don't sort of pick it up and do something with it every day, you really get dissociated from it. And on the plane on the way over, I thought, oh no, I'm going to start something new. And I made a few notes and it was Norman and Sadie and that's where oh, it came from. Oh, and literally I, I on the plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I, so I wrote that. I wrote a few notes. I was like, oh, gosh, because the course was starting in two days from then and so I had this synopsis and I was like, ooh, and it hasn't really changed from then. But that's I had it amazing. and so I hadn't written anything of it and, I, you know, then over that week in the evenings I wrote maybe two or three chapters and everyone loved it so much. I was like, hmm, okay. I think so, I want yeah, something that's amazing. Here. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I often feel like that, though, with anything, sometimes it's when you're not forcing something, you get those moments of inspiration. Like, you know, when you're under pressure to do something or, you you know, you sometimes get those little glimpses of something and you're like, oh, hang on a second. That's actually, there's a, there's actually, something, that's actually there. something there. That could actually be great. You know, that's amazing. Yeah. That's such a cool story. It's, it's true. And I was listening. I was sort of getting up to speed and I was listening. Oh, my gosh, and now it's going to be really bad. Was it the last? Who was your last guest? Deborah She's Oswald. Deborah Oswald. No, not Deborah Oswald. No, the one, no. Oh, gosh, I can Lisa. see her. I only listened. Lisa, Lisa Schwartz. Halloran. Uh, yes, Halloran. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And, and I heard her say something and it was like, oh, yeah, because she said if she's she never forces something. If she's forcing an idea and she's trying yeah. to write and it's not working, she yeah. stops because no, that's not right. the story. That's and I heard that. That was only, yeah, last night or maybe the mm. night before I listened to that. I was like, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, it, and it was so true in my case too. But, you know, when someone that's else right, articulates we were talking it, about it in, re in regards to filming and, and taking photos and stuff as well because we were saying that, yeah, yeah, you know, sometimes yeah. if you're forcing a shot or forcing something to happen, it, it's just not. It just it doesn't, doesn't. It's, it's not it, right. It's, it's not, not authentic. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so so that was really interesting. It's sort of, yeah, that's and I, I feel the same as well because if you, you know, that other story that may or may not come out one day, I'm I'm veering on the knot now because I've got so many where I'm, I'm sort of moving forward yeah. now instead of going back. But, yeah, it was becoming forced and even though I was there and I was still really involved in the story, it was becoming a bit forced for me. So, I, you know, we'll yeah. see. That's sit <laughs> there. Yeah. So... Obviously, so you said you said that you're living in Melbourne now, but you have, as you've mentioned, you spent quite a bit of time in the UK and in Europe. So why was it important for you to the setting of where this novel was? Why was why did it need to be in Edinburgh? Why did it need to be in the UK? I mean, was it because of the sorry, as you could say, I mean, was it because of the of the Edinburgh Fr Fringe Festival? Was that kind of like the f when you were thinking about the setting, you know, was that a primary objective? Okay, well, where are they going to go? And did that then work backwards or how? How did you get there? How did you get there? No, no I tell you, the truth is that I spent so long, I, I'm absolutely, especially now that I live in Melbourne, I absolutely adore Australia, always have, but I've really lived for the past how old am I? But for the past 25, 30 years, I've really lived with one foot in the UK and one foot here. And I've spent, 
you know, I, I, I have a life over there. Almost, well, not even almost. I have a life over there. And as soon as I land there, it's not like being on holidays. It's just like, oh, I just jump jump on the train and yeah, I don't even think about it. So it's very mm. interesting. Yeah. But to be honest, my favourite, my very favourite authors that I would dream of emulating and, and um, sort of being you know, on the bookshelf next to mm-hmm. are people like, um, Nick Hornby and Tony Parsons yeah. and yes. David Nichols and um, of course who wouldn't all those good ones yeah exactly and Roddy Doyle and people like that yes. and so I've got this really weird thing that and, I, and it didn't strike me until I had to start doing interviews and things like this is like I've got this real thing for middle-aged British men writers <laughs> like they are my favorite writers. yeah that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but so if any of you I, are listening, I'm, middle-aged actually, male actually, writers. Actually, some <laughs> middle-aged male, male writers, not others. There are a few that you probably yeah, no, add to that list. <laughs> we won't name but, names. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. But, but really, like, th- that is my, and, you know, and, and now I've sort of, um, I've sort of almost shot myself in the foot because I always say how I love um, Nick Hornby or whatever. And now I'm seeing things pop up and say, oh, if you love Nick Hornby, you'll, you'll love this. Oh. Like, have, I, have I brought that into existence? Oh, yes. Because, but, but that's the style of writing I like. And I never, one day I'm definitely going to write a story set in Australia. Mm. One day, definitely. It's not because I'm denying my Australianness or anything like oh, that. Absolutely. But, but my writing journey feels so... British like I feel the stories that that are in my head that want to come out are definitely set in London in in Britain yeah. generally and I think that and you know my publishing deal is my agent I got my agent in in the UK yeah. I got my mm. first publishing deal in the UK my yeah it's all based around the UK and yeah. so that's this story was written a lot of it I mean it was written actually it's very cosmopolitan the book was written in, it was actually written in Penzance where the story oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was A lot of it was, was written there. It was written in Italy and it was written a lot, was written in Melbourne and it was written in Cairns and it was written in London. But, um, yeah, it, it's always had the British roots. It's always It's always been such a British story for me. And, no... I do remember the original question, Debbie. No, 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 yeah, no, no, not at all. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Because I've just thought of another question. So okay. <laughs> no, well, just the mention of the Edinburgh Fringe. Mm. No, that that wasn't. Again, I don't remember when it came to me, but I did want it to be a journey, and it was like, oh, what is the most? I mean, it's kind of almost like a, yeah, right. It, it, how can a twelve-year like a hopeless, a hopeless yeah. dream? How could a twelve-year-old boy get to? you know, perform at the Edinburgh Fringe, which yeah. is one of the, or, you know, of among course, the probably the biggest top festivals, three most famous yeah, comedy world. festivals. Yeah. yeah and so course. that was sort of purpose built for me. I was like, oh, yeah. And then I got, whoops, got a map of the UK out and I was like, right, where are they going to go? And that's so cool. the journey. That's places amazing. That, yeah. That, yeah, 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 yeah. That's amazing. And yeah. originally you might, I, you might or might not find this funny or interesting. Originally I spent a lot of time, um, I wanted it to be very symbolic, the journey, and I spent a lot of wasted time, believe me, <laughs> trying to make the journey, trying to make the journey from Penzance to Edinburgh in the shape of a J, the letter J. Oh, that's <laughs> so cute. I love that. But, but it really oh didn't gosh, work. Oh, my gosh, I want to make, like, make a tile and put that on our Instagram. No, that's didn't. so cute. Yeah. That's so awesome. It, it, it was so hard to to get it to go there. It was just like. Okay, I'm gonna to have to let this go a little bit. That's <laughs> and when I told my editor, she goes, "Oh, that's so cute." She goes, "Yeah, but you could because it had to to do with timings and yeah. things like that." Yeah, yeah. It, it had to be people, physically possible, didn't it? In terms of physically of, possible, in, in, in and, terms of yeah. their time scale. Yeah, um, yes. yeah, and also stuff like, well, one day they wouldn't drive for. 10 minutes and the next day they'd have to drive for 16 hours. Oh no, of course gosh. not. No, of course not. Oh, that's no, so, so sweet no. though. Yeah, the little, a little back secret yeah. there. That's so that didn't sweet. Work. And, and what, I, what I was actually going to say, and I was just thinking when you were, you were talking about it, is that, um, you know, generally it's thought that, that um, English humour is very similar to Australian humour. But I actually, yeah. it's not. It's not the. It's not the same. I could same. not disagree with that actually, statement more. No, it's it's not the <laughs> same. Just, and this and I've this, never heard. Really? Yeah, that's what? generally. That's generally no. 
<laughs> it was, she was so different. Oh, okay. Katie, Katie, we're going to disagree as well. Yeah, oh, really? I'm, you I'm, think it's the same? Yeah. You know what? I think it's a, it could be a generational thing there because, yeah, I totally, you know what it is, Debbie? Is it because we grew up on the English humour? Because we didn't. I think like, it is. In, yeah. But on, I would say TV, I agree. We, I, we, I think English it's, humor. but no, but what I was actually going to say, Juliet, is that yeah, sorry, this, I can't this does, you off. no, this, this <laughs> does read very much, um, in my my kind of humour, so, so I, I mean, I grew up, you know, I grew up in the UK. Yeah. Um, I came yeah. to Australia. Oh. So, uh, I grew, I can't, came to Australia uh, as an adult via New Zealand. So um, it, it 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 does. It feels very English. The characters. It does. It feels the very authentic. The characters yeah. feel English. The characters. The totally. dialogue. Totally. Feels it does. feels very very English. Now that doesn't exclude it being. Um, read by Australians or feeling as though there's some sort of commonality or link, but it very, very much does feel English English to me. Yeah. I was actually funny you were saying that because my I was literally going to say the same thing and say, Mm. well, to your credit, because in it it does feel you can feel that your authentic experience of living in England comes across in your because I've also spent a lot of time in the UK and I lived there as a kid for a while. Mm. And um yeah, I felt I felt the same. Even even just little subtle things that, unless you had spent a lot of time in the UK, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have you. It, it would be too yeah. obvious. Like the dif- the difference between one day we had digestive biscuits, biscuits, the next day we had ho- <laughs> hobnobs. But you know, you know, to anyone that that it's not an That's overly sort of cultural yeah, it, it's not an overly um, obvious thing unless you kind of have been spent time in the UK. Yeah, and, and it's great that it sounds authentic. And the reason I think it sounds authentic is because I, it, that was effortless for me because I've lived yeah. over there for, you know, I've probably lived over there for at least 15 years, you know, back and forwards and stuff. So, mm. but yeah, but it is funny. And I have always thought that, yeah, and it's a really funny thing. I think it's not necessarily that we're similar, you know, English and, and Australians are similar. It's just that we have, there's a lot, culturally that is similar simply because a lot of the British culture has arrived here. I mean, you know, in the latter years, it's probably more Americanized. We're becoming Mm. more Americanized and we've got more ties with them. But I think definitely when I was growing up, I mean, when we were kids, we didn't have, we didn't even have a TV, but when we finally got a TV, when I was in about grade 12, thanks very much, (laughs) just in time for me to leave home. um, All that we got was we didn't get the, the, we got a few American sitcoms and things like that, but we got the British TV and we got the yeah. British comedian. Well, actually, in our house we did. That's probably it was probably the rest of it was probably out there, but we weren't allowed to watch it. Hmm. But um, so the British humour to me is it's just the pinnacle. I mean, you know, the Aussies are the funniest people in the world, also. But the British humour it just gets me. I, I just think it's amazing, yeah. and I do think it's similar to to us. I do think we've. I do think we laugh at the same things, maybe. I've- I, I I think I think we do. Yeah, I know. I think I think we do in terms of in terms of comedians. Um, but I, I but I do think yeah. there is a, there is a. Yeah. I think there's there's more self deprecation in in um, in English uh, yeah, humour. That's, that's what I. Than, yeah, I agree. Than there is in yeah. in, 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 a, in Australian. In Australian. And I think yeah. that, and I think that I, that's I feel like actually one Australian of the, humour is is instead of self deprivation, it's like it's inflicted on others I don't know it's a different I don't know I feel like mm. yeah it's sort of good-natured poking at it's people good that I think Australia a bit rather more so. rather than <laughs> rather than, make, than making making fun, fun of, of yourself, yourself which I think yeah, is, no, is, right, a, is a big yeah. hallmark of yeah. uh, um but of English that comedy actually, that's a really good observation actually I do like that and it's you know someone who read and actually she well she doesn't work for them anymore she's unfortunately one of my favorite people who worked for penguin random house mm. she when she first read um norman she goes oh my god i love sadie so much she sounds so aussie and i was like 
Really? Don't say that because then it sounds unauthentic. But she sticks by it. She goes, I just love her because she's got every sensibility of Australian women and stuff. So that was another take on it. And I never thought that at all. No, but it was really no, interesting. No, she, okay. was, she said that. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, Julieta, actually continuing talking about um, comedy a little bit more, um, I love the fact that Norman and Jax um, liked those old school um comedians that such as you and I grew up on we were just talking about that such as uh, as Dave Allen I mean my same as you um when I was a child although I was in the UK then you know we always watched the Dave Allen show and you had the two Ronnies and um you know all of those fantastic fantastic shows do you think that comedy has changed I mean you know it's it, it for us, it kind of feels nostalgic, reliving that kind of that kind of comedy. And I guess in twelve-year-old boys, it's sort of a little bit quirky. Um, yeah. But um, why did you why did you choose that particular era of comedy? And do you think that comedy has has changed recently in recent years? Yeah, I chose that particular era. I chose all Norman's and Jax's favourite comedians are all my favourite comedians. So that's why I chose it. Yeah. Um, because, look, I just, Dave Allen, obviously he gets quite a few mentions as well, but I, I, I have never come across anyone like Dave Allen. I don't know why he gets me. I think it was because I first got into him when I was too young, way too young to understand because he was really satirical and he was having a go at the Catholic Church and he was having a go at the, the, the politicians and with stuff. With his little glass of whiskey or cold yeah, tea and there. And his little finger. And his finger and that was cut life. off. Yeah. Was it that thing? And, and I just used to, I remember that was, the thing I used to wait for was, good night, God bless, and may your God go with you. And I loved that so much. It was like sitting there waiting for that. I just loved that. So anyway, um, so I wanted Jackson Norman, I wanted them to be very sort of quirky and and that, and I just I just thought that would be just the idea of of of, of politicians. I was going to say of comedians like Dave Allen and like Bob Mortimer, who's still alive and still being very funny. Hmm. But you know, people like Morecambe and Wise and the two Ronnies, the idea of them being lost forever, um, it makes me really sad because I think they're so funny and I think they they do transcend the generations. Like even if people, young people now watch them, I don't think they could help but laugh because it's good, not necessarily good clean humour. Most of it is, but just with a little a little edge. But yeah. I think, and the different, the, the second thing that you, you mentioned about whether it's changed, I do think comedy's changed a lot. I think, and I think it's kind of changed, and I'm not talking about those guys because I think, although they did it in a subtle way, I think it's more about, I think we're definitely um, comedians are punching up now. I anyway, mean, that's the that's the rule of that's the real rule of comedy is never punch down. And so many comedians in the past, I think, do do that, even if it's ones that are punching down self-deprecatingly. That's even a word, mm. um, you know. And I think a lot, you know, things are being more politically correct and all of that. And I think that's a really good thing because I think it's it's forced comedians to not just be um, you know, you can be funny if, if you're being mean. Meanness is is quite funny sometimes. Sad as it sad as it it is, we do laugh. At, you know, even the nicest of people will have a guilty laugh at something that's a bit mean. And I think that's that's becoming less and less the norm now, which I do I, think yeah, is a great I think thing. So. Which is yeah. A, yeah, which is which is a good thing. I mean, I guess the other thing is, you know, is uh, yeah, there was always innuendo. Um, yeah. Um, in 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 mm. comedy, but usually quite quite subtle. Um, yeah, and I think that I mean, sort of that, 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 that it did say, then could change. You imagine. Mm. No, carry on, carry on. <laughs> no, I was just about to say, could you imagine? And I'd never even liked him, but could you imagine Benny Hill today being running a? You know, no. he's pretty no. horrid. No, but, no, know, no, no. I did, I actually didn't even think he was funny then. No, me um. either. It's not <laughs> funny. No, I didn't either. I don't know who did. Who uh, did? Well, a lot of well, lots of people did. He was hugely successful for a very long time. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. 
didn't particularly like it. And I guess sort of maybe after that generation of comedians we're talk we were talking about, you know, then things did become, you know, um, profanity became a big thing in comedy and as you say sort of more that satirical real mean real meanness um, mm. um and less and innuendo I, and more sort of in your face yeah there is another thing though that I think I think those old comedians and I guess that's why it worked in well with having Jackson Norman um I, I think that sort of the old time comedy even though there are those subtle adults only things. It's a bit like The Simpsons, you know. The Simpsons is so successful with so much in The Simpsons that is that is adults only, but the kids don't get it. So it, totally. it transcends the generations. Yes. Totally. And I think those those old comedians do that too. I think I think a seven year old could watch someone like the two Ronnies or like Dave Allen and find so much humor in it. Find them without hilarious. Totally. Without knowing, actually, you totally. know, the very clever whatever you know nuances that go on behind it. Yeah. So, so I yeah. like that. Yeah. And I, you know, and you know, I did. I do mention in the book at one stage. You know, someone's talking about the the new style comedians that you know swearing is is the new funny sort of thing. Yeah. And and again, you can't. How I went to see. I won't name mm. names, but I went to see because it was the Melbourne Comedy Festival here. I went to see two comedians last week, which was wonderful. Um, and they both came out going, blah, like F, 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 this, this, this. Yeah. And, and it is funny. It kind of is funny. Why, why people swearing is funny, I don't know, but it kind of is. But I also, and I don't mind, I don't, whatever. But I like that the old-time comedians were funny without having without to do that. Without, yeah. without having to do that, totally. exactly. It's without a cheap having laugh. to rely on that. I think it's that. a cheap laugh. Yeah. I mean, if we started effing and blinding now, people would probably want, it'd probably be quite funny because to see three ladies sitting there going, you know, in on some level it would be funny, but it would be a cheap laugh, you know. Totally. Yeah, it I really agree. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, loved, I, I love the quirks that you had between Jax and Norman. But there's actually, I wanted to ask you, and it wasn't in your questions, but I, I wanted to ask you why it was important for you to give Norman a physical um, obstacle to overcome because I, the way that you write about his paralysis is just... His psoriasis. His psoriasis, not paralysis, sorry. <laughs> psoriasis <laughs> is... Um, She's very pregnant. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. My words get mixed. Um, is, is really graphic and, I, I mean, I've had... I've had bouts of really bad eczema throughout my life and so to me reading that I had so much physical empathy for that for for him yeah. going through that and I just wondered you know because um Norman's lost his best friend he feels for his mum you know which I, I I really loved as well that you illuminated um this the hardships that being a single mother can have with Sadie. That was really, really beautifully done. But I just wondered why it was important to give him this also a physical thing to 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 carry on through. Uh, yeah, I mean, hadn't he got enough to overcome? Yes. <laughs> with that, with that, yes poor child. child. <laughs> poor child. <laughs> why? <laughs> I know, I know. It's a very cruel, isn't it? Um, on one level, on one level, it's certainly a and and this wasn't um, this wasn't conscious, but I guess uh, reverse engineering it, it maybe possibly it was was I wanted this amazing, beautiful, gorgeous, courageous kid. I wanted him to have as much you know thrown at him as possible. Yes. So I wanted to make him have to face these these most terrible obstacles or challenges or whatever, and and still come through victorious, but. Like I say, I didn't consciously set to do that, but it was when I say, when I don't say that he came into my head fully formed, he came into my head with psoriasis. Yes, right. So, so that is the, that's the basic truth of it. Um, but then as I started to do, I had to do a lot of research on it because I obviously wanted to get it right. I mean, I've suffered, you say you've suffered, Katie, from eczema. I've suffered from some terrible skin conditions in the past, just in the past few years. Um, that turned out to be an allergy. But right. I, you know, I had a stage where I literally couldn't leave the house because I wow. was so horrifically yeah, yeah. whatever. But, um, and interestingly, I know it sounds weird, but the truth of it, hand on heart, as I was writing Norman with his psoriasis, my 
face and arms were getting worse, which was wow. really, it was, it was a weird yes. thing. It probably had not, no connection whatsoever. No, I believe it. I believe it. Even if I think about getting itchy, I, I come out in a rash. So yeah, I, I believe but it. Was, it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but also there was a very conscious, and this came afterwards, but once I started to write a boy that had this, um, this sort of challenge, that had this skin condition, I remembered, um, and this was definitely after the fact, I didn't have an inspiration. I remembered a very good friend of mine who um, had really bad, she had eczema also, not psoriasis. She had really bad eczema. And in the days when you had to go into the Commonwealth Bank with your little passbook mm -hmm. to get money out, and she was only about, I guess she would have been in her 20, oh, I mean, we might even have been younger actually, it might have been in our late teens or something. And I was waiting outside the bank for her and she came out and she was like, there was, she was crying. And I said, what? And she goes, oh, when I handed my book over, she saw the girl go like this. Recoil. Like the yeah. bank teller. Yeah. And she, she was so hurt by it. And the girl probably either did it subconsciously, didn't think yeah. about it or whatever, because then she had to, or probably did. I don't know. And I don't know. I, it just, that, that memory came back to me and I thought, God, you know, not being all, um, I mean, it's, I'm not trying to send messages across or anything like that, but mm. I think anything that can is normalise the right word, but it, it, that can normalise people's differences yeah. um, and show that they're, show their feelings about, you know, we've all got our own story and you might take a double take at someone who's got shocking, some skin condition mm -hmm. or a birthmark or something like that, but I'm all for getting out there as much as possible that, you know, that person's a person, they're going through something, they're not an object to be looked at That's and everyone's amazing. got their own story. Yes, and yeah. just yes. to, I, I'm not sure that normalising is the right word, but just to normal, just awareness. get some empathy, Awareness empathy, and empathy, yeah. empathy, empathy, awareness, acceptance. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. For anything, you know, for anything, no matter what it is, whether That's it's amazing. someone with a skin condition or with a, you know, a facial difference or, or something, just anything to, to yeah. make us realise that there's all, you know, normal comes in all shapes and forms. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've certainly had so many experiences when I've been covered in eczema and people, really? you know, the first thing people say is they just want to stop you on the street and go, oh, that looks really sore. And you're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. Yes. But you telling me oh that it's God. sore is making it so much worse. <laughs> so just, you know, shove this up your bum. And, yeah. and, and, and I loved that Leonard was just so accepting of it and just, and yeah. he just, he, oh, well, yeah, yeah, okay, no worries. Well, let's just, you know, sort this out. And yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I love that. So I thought um, yeah. it was beautifully written and, and that sort oh, of thank um, you. Good. something that yeah. can be really, really, he just had such a good attitude about it, um, but I also felt like it had a, he had a British attitude about it, <laughs> in a yes. in a sense of yes. oh well, dip up a lip, just get off. <laughs> this is just me. Oh well, <laughs> yeah. let's, yeah. let's go. carry it. No, carry on. No, no, that was it. Oh, I, was I, I, was yes. say, I was going to say. Well, let, let's actually um, let's actually talk about Leonard a little bit because I I'm in love with Leonard. Leonard. <laughs> Um, Me too. I want. I, I want. I want to claim Len Leonard. I want a Leonard. <laughs> and and what and what I um I thought was so fantastic the way you portrayed him is that is that kind of you flipped that stereotypical grumpy old man who who sort of unwillingly or unwittingly you know gets adopted by young people and and um that we've seen in so many books in in yeah. in recent years where um where perhaps to start with you know when you see him cleaning you can kind of think oh yeah he's he's that character but but he isn't he is so so much more um he was just delight a delight so tell us about Leonard oh Leonard I love Leonard so much um and I think that is spot on what you just said then about flipping it because I did I obviously I didn't want him to be cliched and that's not you know, casting aspersions on anyone who yeah. uses grumpy old men because I love grumpy old men in stories as well. But Leonard never, he was never, ever going to be a grumpy old man. I, I wanted to make him, I wanted to make him the opposite of a grumpy old man, you know. And and what you said, Katie, about being sort of very stiff, up, British stiff upper lip, you know, Leonard has, you know, we find out more as we go along, but any old person has a life 
be behind them, which you don't know about. And he's been through so many things. I mean, he's been through war, world, two world wars and another war. You know, he's been through a lot, that guy. And so he, he sort of knows, you know, one of one of my grandma's favourite sayings was, <laughs> I've forgotten more than he'll ever know. Yes. <laughs> I love that so much. And that's that kind of a bit, of a bit Leonard-y. But, um, but Leonard, the funny story about Leonard is, not the funny thing about Norman Foreman, the funny thing about Leonard is um, he was always in the book and he was always in the first draft of the book, but he was had a very small part in the first draft of the book. Um, and there was another character who had a bit more of a part. And when I first got my agent and I was working with her on it, she, she said to me absolutely correctly, she said, these two characters, they are playing the same role in the book. They play the same role. There's too many people in that car. No, <laughs> but um, they played the same role role in in terms of um you know in terms of Norman and yeah, Sadie yeah and I was yeah. like oh and she said and just as an offhand sort of thing well it wasn't offhand it was we were editing but she said you know you, you need to lose Leonard Leonard's it, it, he's not benefiting the story he's this he's that and I was like oh, okay and well I wasn't I, I said okay to her face but I was just going oh, oh no I love Leonard <laughs> and I and I loved Leonard so much simply because I really like old people <laughs> um you know, there's probably, and I've be, uh, been asked if he's based on a real person, and there's definitely elements of my dad in Leonard, but not he, he's nothing like him, but there's definitely elements just just because of, you know, elderly people's, you know, manners yeah, and things course. like that. Mm. But, but I loved Leonard so much, and I spent, I had about six weeks to do this first edit, and I spent so long trying to work him out of the story, and it was a really easy you know physically it was a very easy thing to do you just leave him out but, but I just couldn't and my yeah my heart was not in it and I really angsted and I literally lost sleep over it because you know my dream had come true and I'd got my dream agent and I was you know mm. well it wasn't being published then yet I hadn't got my publishing deal and I really wanted to be easy to work with and and I knew she was the expert as well and I knew she knew what she was talking about but I just couldn't I, I made myself sick trying to get rid of him and so eventually after you know I'd done it was a couple of minor things, and then I, I called her and I said, "Oh, Sue, I'm I'm just having so much trouble. I'm I don't want to be difficult, and I know you're right. I do know you're right, but I I, I love Leonard so much. I can't get rid of him." And she said, "Oh," she said, "Julietta, you know, she goes, don't worry about it. She goes, what about the no, other like character? The guy's name. She goes, what about the other guy? As soon as she said that, said, well, it doesn't have to be him. Just just what about the other guy?" And as soon as she said it, the penny dropped and I was like, oh, he can go. I had, no, um, I, I had no love left towards him at all, although I do love him. He might show up in another book because I did quite like him as well. And within about three days, I'd rewritten it all. And then in the next draft, in the next draft then because what I did was I kind of blended, I didn't blend their characteristics, but I blended the two characters and what they did, the role they played. Right, um, so Leonard became bigger. I blended them sort of almost into one. And then suddenly Leonard just took on a life of his own and so he became the star of the show. And so, you know, so Leonard Leonard got to stay and his reward was that he got a much bigger part. And, yeah, look, I think I love Leonard so much and just, just the way he continues to learn and he's always doing courses and he's, you know, really into the it, younger generation. He finds it yeah. really, he doesn't sort of tut tut and go, oh, the younger yeah, he finds it fabulous, and he wants to be on it. And, and you know, him being a whiz on social media—that's kind of like my mum. She's in her eighties, and she's such a she's she'll probably watched this. <laughs> that's amazing. It's it actually it's quite, quite, quite 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 funny this week, Julietta. Um, obviously, um, and this is this is um, date stamping this. Um, Prince Philip passed <laughs> away, obviously, a, a, yeah. a week ago. Yeah. So there've been you know massive amounts in in the press about him and um you know one of the key things about him was he always said well you just have to carry on you know you just have to yeah. pull yourself up by your socks and carry on but there was a lovely article um written earlier in the week about for apparently for a long long time he took an electric frying pan with him whenever he was on tour with the queen and he got up and cooked her a cooked breakfast every morning apparently this is true oh is that God. did for years he took this he took this electric frying pan with him so they could have breakfast together and i thought it's leonard 
Oh, oh how It actually just popped that? into that my head nice and I was thinking story. all of the things that he did. You know, Aww. he watched, he loved, apparently loved watching cooking shows in his later years um, and then would go into the kitchen <laughs> and do all of this stuff. And uh, I thought, oh, he's a, he was actually that's nailed. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so nice. That's such a lovely story. I've never yeah. heard that one. That is so nice. But, yeah, I mean, and wouldn't we all want to? When we get to that mm. age, I would much rather be a, an, a, a I hope I am a Leonard, you know, like when I'm that old, I hope I'm still, you know, trying to learn things and and fun and Mm. appreciating younger people rather than berating them. You know, I think from, you know, generationally, you understand the next generation may be above and below, but a couple of generations is probably really hard to understand and to even comprehend. Like if you're someone that old, well, definitely mobile phones Mm. weren't invented, but phones weren't even invented, internet. No, no, exactly. So I think it's really, I I think, oh, there should be Leonard classes or something like that, like be more Leonard, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for letting us feel so many great, beautiful feelings. So (laughs) thank you. Oh, it's been so nice to chat to you too because, as I said, I've watched I've watched a lot of your, um, I was going to say podcasts, what are they called on, on Instagram, TV? Things. I do yeah. TVs, yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, so oh, I feel very, well, very you. privileged and happy you. to be on them. Oh, yes, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Maybe I will have to send you a little uh, Leonard T-shirt. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Julieta. And um, we really We've loved talking to you yeah, and appreciate all the time you've given us. So thank you so, so much. Oh, and we are so you. excited for everybody to listen to this episode and to tell us what they thought as well. So thank yes. you so much. Okay. Me too. Thank you. Okay. okay bye. 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 <laughs> Oh my gosh, Julietta is Julietta is so sweet. It's so cute. The way that she was got talking about the fact that she was trying to make the map, the road trip that they go on, the shape of the J just yes. was so, so cute. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so sweet. So thank you, Julietta. We love talking to you. We did. You were an absolutely beautiful person and, and your I, book is absolutely beautiful. And I hope you all enjoyed it too. Yeah, absolutely. So the second book for me, I am very excited about this one. So we have teamed up with HarperCollins and we are doing, drum roll, uh, The Truth About Her by Jacqueline Maley. Mm-hmm. So what's it okay. about? Okay. So this is another book, if you like, well, because it's Mother's Day, so it's another book about relationships with mothers, if you like. Um, So the main character, uh, Susie, is a journalist um, who is working in Sydney and she she specialises in doing feature articles about people. And one day she gets a tip about a well-known fitness blogger who claims to have cured cancer by her uh, regimen of of healthy eating Um, and has gained millions and millions of followers and sponsorship and book deals and so on and so forth. Um, However, the claim is that this woman never had cancer at all go forward a couple of weeks and on the the day after Susie's article comes out um, she finds out that the fitness blogger has in fact taken her own life Um, and then Susie's own life if you like begins to feel the repercussions because the hate that comes towards her not only from the fitness blogger's family but also from the general public at large um, really has a profound effect on her own life. Mm -hmm. So it's a goodie. It's a goodie and a a book for anyone that finds um, this big social dilemma of Instagram and blogging and um, is what we put out there really what makes meets the eye is that really the truth behind what's going on in our lives and also and also how much are we accountable exactly for what we put out there yeah Yeah, exactly so everybody we are really excited for you all to join us in our second book of may and we cannot wait to speak to you soon happy reading we hope you enjoyed watching this episode if you did please leave us a comment below we'll see you soon